You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. We're back again today with a new recording of an older tale, one of my own stories. Peter Craft, model citizen, the tale of a man who isn't quite human. I was fortunate enough to receive praise from the great Thomas Ligotti regarding this one, so I thought it was worth tackling again in order to do it justice. You can read the story in my ebook collection, Tell Me What You Know of Fear, which I've linked below. Thanks as always for giving these originals a chance, folks. And without further ado. Peter Craft, Model Citizen, by Ian Gordon Few things haunt me the way the memory of Peter Craft does. Seasoned though I was, twenty-four years on the force and a decorated officer, a single lifetime was insufficient in its capacity to prepare me for an evening in his company. Generally speaking, Raleigh is a quiet British town, its criminal fraternity inconspicuous compared to its counterparts in the neighbouring cities of Preston and Manchester. So, when Kraft was brought in for questioning all those years ago, I was unwise as to the nature of his alleged crime. Looking back, perhaps it was nothing more than his ability to draw breath. The arresting officer, a young upstart by the name of Ferguson, who was doing his rounds down by Moor Park, was approached by a young lady who, she claimed, had become a little concerned regarding the presence of a strange man watching the kids on the park. The lady, the mother of two small children, directed Ferguson to a bench on the periphery of the play area. There, he discovered the unusual fellow sitting quite peacefully, head in the clouds. Though the odd character was indeed close to the play area, Ferguson noted an absent expression upon his face, a face which, oddly, was smeared haphazardly with white face paint. The young officer was more than a little disturbed by the man's outward appearance, his clothing more akin to costume than common attire. The stranger was unresponsive as Ferguson questioned him, and as a result of his silence, the young officer took the decision to arrest him. Perhaps formal questioning would open him up. There were no protests, just the recognised mechanics of compliance. Some ten minutes later, Ferguson arrived at the station, craft in tow. It was there, in the diffuse lighting of the interrogation room, that I first laid my eyes upon him. Strange though his presence was, I couldn't help but think a stronger word was required to describe the man's peculiarity. Abnormal, perhaps? He wore a tight-fitting black suit, beneath which sharp, protruding shoulders pointed towards the ceiling. Appallingly thin, the garment served only to exaggerate his cadaverous proportions, truly a shocking display of malnourishment. Or worse, though outwardly youthful in appearance, his gait was awkward, like the laboured progression of a man advancing in years. But the body was merely an introduction to the man's staggering irregularity. The face, his face, I just couldn't fathom the details my eyes were presented with. The thick white paint masking every inch of flesh was cracked about the eyes and mouth, horribly unsettling. Mounds of black, unnatural hair spilled onto his forehead, assuredly a toupee. Lips, tastelessly smothered with red lipstick, served only to accentuate the total lack of definition there, and dark, bloodshot eyes glaring at me from the depths of some unknowable abyss screamed disillusionment. Or was it childlike wonder? That look, that very first look, I can see it now. Oh, how carefully Kraft studied me. Seated opposite me, separated only by a simple article of furniture— his amorphous, protruding jaw threatened to open. No words came out. A set of perfect teeth gleamed at me. Even that troubled me. 
"'What's your name?' I asked. He opened his mouth again, this time managing Peter. P-I-E-T-E-R. His voice lacked character, lacked inflection. Surname, I continued. Craft. C-R-A-F-T. I nodded. What were you doing in the park today, Mr. Craft? Craft hesitated, but his eyes never left mine. I... I do not know. You weren't up to no good, were you, Mr. Craft? My question seemed to puzzle him, his brow furrowed, cracking the paint there. No good? he echoed. Yes, no good. Were you watching the children, Mr. Craft? He simply shook his head. The look of bewilderment remained fixed upon his made-up face. Ferguson, who was loitering in the shadows behind me, leaned forwards and whispered in my ear, To be fair, boss, I didn't see him eyeing up the kids. He was just staring into space. It was bloody weird. I nodded in acknowledgement. I awoke about an hour ago. Kraft started, and paused, before clarifying, I awoke on the bench. Are you homeless, Mr. Kraft? His pointy shoulders shrugged. I do not know. That white face. I felt incredibly uncomfortable conversing with the man. Why the face paint? I pressed. Kraft simply leaned to his left and glared at himself in the two-way mirror behind me. He shook his head, replying, I do not know. I turned to Ferguson for reassurance. Ferguson shrugged. Okay, Mr. Kraft, I continued. How long were you asleep on the bench? Once again, Kraft answered, I do not know. But before I could question him further, gloved hands emerged from beneath the table. He placed them delicately upon the surface and spoke. First I saw the trees, tall and green. The light hurt my eyes. I had to look away. Then I saw the park, the children on the swings, back and forth, back and forth. The motion made me dizzy. So I looked at the ground, saw more things, the litter and the insects, the ants. The ants were busy, working. I liked the ants. Then my eyes felt better. So I looked to the clouds, the fluffy shapes in the sky, white, blue, like a dream. Throughout his rambling speech, Kraft never once broke eye contact. Oh, how it bothered me. Climbing to my feet, I motioned to Ferguson. Excuse us, Mr. Kraft. Kraft simply nodded as the two of us left the room. Standing in the corridor, Ferguson and I discussed the possibility that the strange man in our interrogation room might just be a patient at Western Hospital, a psychiatric facility on the outskirts of town. Coincidentally, we were approached by a member of front counter staff, Leighton, who advised us of the arrival of a doctor from Weston, a man by the name of Philip Stanton Gordon. I met with Dr. Gordon in the reception area, who, quite oddly, bore a striking resemblance to the peculiar fellow sitting quietly in the interrogation room. The similarities were difficult to deduce, though, as one had to take into account the large quantity of paint masking Kraft's face. Politely, I introduced myself and, The gentleman acted in kind, the delivery of his words slow and considerate. Allegedly, Kraft was indeed a patient at the hospital, and had, and I quote, wandered off the premises earlier that morning. Concerned for Kraft's well-being, Dr. Gordon claimed the station was naturally his first port of call. When I queried Kraft's unsettling appearance, Gordon added a curious and somewhat convenient nugget of data. Kraft and several other patients were dressed and made up as such due to the pending arrival of Halloween, a mere three days away. I was understandably dubious. If the good doctor was to be believed, we had in our midst a lone psychiatric patient in full costume who just so happened to wander into town, alone and without guidance. My dubiousness persisted. Dubious or not, the events that followed were truly inconceivable. Suspicious and doubtful, 
Ferguson and I accompanied the good doctor to the observation room, in order to allow him an opportunity to confirm that the man in custody was in fact one of his patients. There was a confirmation all right, but it manifested itself in an incomprehensible horrifying form that I still have trouble with to this day. The awkward, distorted figure of Peter Craft stood upright before the two-way mirror, his white face practically touching the glass. Although he appeared to look at us, he looked only at himself. Engaged in some probing, arcane study, Kraft slowly removed his gloves, revealing smooth, china-like hands, lacking fingernails. Coupled with what I believed was a total lack of facial hair, I later concluded that had he stopped there, I would have labelled him a recipient of Christ Siemens Terrain Syndrome. But he hadn't stopped there. A bold index finger ventured towards his left temple. He pinched the flaky paint there, and began to peel. Away it came, revealing further china-like flesh, smooth, white, and blemish-free. Kraft continued to peel and flay, until all that remained was an abstract, inorganic visage, a porcelain head. Other than those awful perfect teeth, the only remaining human element were those bloodshot eyes, agonized, watery spheres staring longingly at their own reflection, a terrible, penetrating vision. I swear that hideous gaze met my own. Aghast, I turned to Dr. Gordon. I found no comfort there, just a curious look of familiarity and inevitability. With a crippling lack of dexterity, Kraft yanked at the black toupee and tossed it aside. The mannequin form almost fully realized. Two tiny apertures either side of his smooth head marked precisely where ears might once have been. Then came one final demonstration of self-mutilation. Kraft slid two blunt fingers and a clumsy thumb into his left eye socket and caressed the bloodshot orb residing there. Calmly and without hesitation, he extracted the eyeball and held it for a few seconds in front of his remaining eye. He tossed it aside as yellow, viscous fluid began to ooze from the open hollow. I gasped. Ferguson heaved. Dr. Gordon vacated the room. I assumed he was going to intervene, to stage the big reveal, just a horror show, an elaborate prank. No intervention, no revelation followed. Gordon disappeared. Kraft remained. Ferguson and I were left staring into the remaining eye of the mannequin man who had, not but ten minutes ago, introduced himself as Peter Kraft. Who or what he was would remain a mystery. The nightmare vision of Kraft in his final glory served only to open doors Ferguson and I would forever wish we could close. Before collapsing to the floor as nothing more than a macabre mixture of porcelain, mustard, and cheap fabric, Kraft uttered through perfect teeth, I'm falling apart. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.